Minnesota this morning. All right. Friday, September 1st, 9-12 in the morning, 85 degrees and humid. Welcome to the uh, holiday weekend, everybody. I'm headed out uh, to the warehouse to meet Adrian this morning. Uh, Adrian is bringing over his uh, 2019 Cub and the trailer uh, and dropping that off. I'm buying that from him. Uh, he told me he was going to sell it uh, a while back and I said, man, I'll take it. So he said, all right. <laughs> so it'll uh, sit there at the warehouse for a little while. I guess I need to fill up on gas. Uh, yes, I've got my wallet. Okay. Uh, yeah, what's my autonomy? Do I want to stop now? Oh, come on now. Don't mess with me. 66 months now. I'll go ahead and fill up. So I took a comment from a channel viewer this morning, another Rebel 1100 owner, and uh, he said that uh, his Rebel is also doing the idle hang nonsense. And he's got a brand new bike. I guess it's a 22 or 23, and it only has 800 and something miles on it. So... He, the, the, what he described are the exact symptoms that this one has been doing in the heat uh, where it uh, kind of self runs, the idle hangs high uh, in first and second gear while decelerating and uh, he articulated the point a little bit better than I did where he's uh, cruising along in uh, first gear and without the uh, throttle being opened, you know, just going along uh, it tries to run along at like 8 to 13 miles an hour or something like that and then he said it's also doing it in second gear kind of self running and just keeping itself going when it should be decelerating on closed throttle it's going you know 20 something miles an hour so yeah that's exactly what mine has been doing I noticed it immediately after the uh, after I got it back from the dealer they had done the DCT reset and I thought yeah, maybe that did it uh, but the next day when I commuted with it, I did that live commute video that kind of dropped in and out. I apologize. <laughs> uh, it was still idle hanging when I got down off of the highway. So it's still there, but again, it was, uh, it's really when it's very hot outside, uh, is when it seems to be more pronounced. So I think it's a temperature sensor issue. I'm not sure. I mean, it could be you know, in my bike's case, it could be uh, sticking throttle plates due to carbon buildup or some nonsense like that. But, you know, his bike is brand new with 800 and something miles. So that tells me that it's something else in the software or a sensor that might be causing it. So, I don't know. We'll keep an eye out on it. I'll let you know if anything else develops, uh, if it gets better or worse, or if and when I find a solution to it. If it gets really bad, you know, I'm definitely going to take it back and open a... Uh, warranty case with Honda uh, more than just asking the dealer to diagnose it I'll actually call Honda and uh, you know send them a registered letter or whatever it is because that's a safety issue and it needs to be found and fixed oh cool a wind-up key <coughs> uh, that's a safety issue if it's hanging high and should be decelerating if it's self running that is a safety issue because you have to actively fight it with the brakes to slow down and that's not cool so, I have to figure that out. Rut row. I don't think my spot's available unless I come around the other side. Yeah, it is. I can get in there. Oh, I can get in there. Do -do 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 -do. So, anyway, we'll find out if that uh, is just a, a glitch that can be fixed through uh, relearning with the DCT, you know, doing the DCT reset, or uh, if it just continues uh, if it continues that tells me it's a sensor not just software so we'll find out whoa it's full Look at that 780 L-stop right there. Oh, just on the edge of the neck. Total 11,260. Man, I, uh, I'm jealous, uh, Gus, if you're watching, uh, on the Rebel 11. He said that he's going out riding uh, this weekend in West Virginia. And, man, 
If I had known, I might try to get up there for that. That would be fun. We've got a long weekend here, so it could happen. It could happen. I could have done it. Could have, would have, should have. Be a hell of a ride to go up there just for, you know, a two day, three day weekender, but that would still be okay. I'd do it. I would do it. Adrian's going to be meeting me there at the warehouse at 1030, so I think I still got time. What is it? Hey, we got 919. Yeah, I got plenty of time. So, get there and uh, clear out a spot for the little uh, cub to hang out at the warehouse for a while. I will uh, try to continue getting my warehouse together for the quasi garage series, uh, get that kicked off, and I'll probably do uh, a couple of good tear down refurbish videos. Uh, I'll either rip into my cub or his cub, pull the motor out of it, and do the uh, timing idler and timing chain refresh on it because I'm sure they are fairly worn after our uh, 10,000 mile blast around the country. Uh, that's why I haven't been riding my cub very much. I'm a little leery about uh, riding it a whole lot more without knowing the condition of that idler. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, horror shows on YouTube and in the forums with uh, Grom owners that have high miles on theirs, you know, a lot of high speed running, highway use, and uh, they show their uh, little timing chain idler wheel after 10,000 miles, and it's just whittled down to less than half of its original diameter, which is kind of crazy. I guess it's just a plastic or polymer wheel of some kind instead of being uh, you know, a hardened steel or an alloy of some kind. Don't know. I've seen some aftermarket parts that are available from uh, Kitako and uh, a handful of others. I think yumanashi has got one too. There have been a few. Uh, SP Takagawa I know has one, but it's the, the whole arm. It's uh, you know, the, the idler wheel and the arm and the spring tensioner, the whole bit. Uh, it's supposed to be higher quality, but then again, I've heard stories of those failing as well, and you don't want those things to fail because it's going to chip your engine. The Cub is a non-interference engine, uh, so if the valves are down, when the piston comes all the way up they're not going to overlap but you know any kind of failure of a moving part inside the motor if it hand grenades in there it's just going to cause a lot of collateral damage grinding up in the sump so never want any loose metal chunks floating around in there so that might be a good opportunity for me to install the 143cc kit on one of the bikes, whether it's uh, mine or Adrian's. Well, they're both mine now, but we'll call them uh, Quasi's and Adrian's. <laughs> cub A, Cub B, I don't know. Play with the 143cc kit, throw the PCX150 injector in there and see how it runs. I don't think there's any other real engine mapping that needs to happen, but I do have the uh, PowerVision 3 from DynoJet that I can plug into the bikes and retune them a little bit. Well, let me qualify that. I have it right now. I may not have it uh, if somebody buys my Riker with all of the toys. I, I advertised that yesterday, finally, uh, with uh, all the pictures and the breakdown of what it's gonna have with it for the right price. Basically 6,000, no, oh, $7,000, sorry. It's between like $6,800 and $7,000 of upgrades and accessories that are going with that Riker. For $9,500 is the asking price. So it's a good deal, real, real good deal. Book value on it right now is $98.75 private party and uh, like just under 7,000 dealer trade-in. So that's why the, you know, the quotes that I was getting from the dealers for only 6,000, nah, I don't know about that. They're giving me a thousand under their book trade-in. That's bullshit. And they're gonna turn around and sell it for 9,000 and change, so. Yeah, uh, again, I don't mind the dealer making a little bit of money, but come on, 3,000 bucks, that's rape. So yeah, play with the, the Cubs, do a little rebuild series on that, but then I've got all my other 
projects that I really need to get going that are sitting in my garage in the warehouse. I need to get the XT250 back on the road because I want to do some fall moto camping uh, with that, hopefully. So I'll buy the regulator rectifier kit. I might need uh, the whole stator assembly, I'm not really sure. So I need to get in contact with Rick's stators and find out if they still make the uh, high output stator and uh, lithium regulator for the XT. They used to a few years ago, but I don't know if it's still available. I'll have to find out. If it's not, then I'll just go back to the factory regulator rectifier. It's like a hundred bucks and change or something like that. Slap it on there, see if it behaves itself. Got to get a new battery now for the XT, of course, because one that's in there is shot. After the XT, I've got the Silver Wing, the Navi too, but the Navi's not really a refurbish. It's just to put the wiring back together. It needs to be ridden. Hell, I might, I might mess with that today and leave this at the warehouse and ride the Navi back home. I haven't had the Navi on the road in a while, at least six months. Uh, the Silver Wing project, I could. I'll probably do that one at home because the bike is already there and I don't really want to ride it back to the warehouse in order to do the project. So I'll probably do the, the, the silver wing on my back patio. But after the weather cools off, man, I can't deal with this 105, 106 degrees in the shade nonsense. It's too hot. And it's not the heat here that gets you, it's the humidity. Blah. It's sitting in a bowl of hot gumbo. And then, then I would really, really like to get my classic Hondas back on the road. I have the uh, 1978 Honda CB125S single that is a basket case, literally, sitting in multiple boxes and baskets in my garage. So I could load that up in the back of the truck, haul it to the warehouse and do that project there. I have most everything to put it back together. Uh, I was waiting on finding an original fuel tank and uh, a couple of other little minor bits and bobs, but other than that, it's ready to be put back together. I was gonna strip the engine on that one too. Go ahead and pull the, the jug and put a fresh piston and rings, or at least, you know, yeah, I'll do piston and rings. I'll probably hone the cylinder if I don't replace the cylinder. So clean that up a little bit. If I have to bore the cylinder out, then obviously that's the first task because I need to know what the overbore ring and piston is going to be. And then after that, I would like to get my CL175 Scrambler back on the road too. Uh, it was running when I parked it, but it needed serious help on the brakes and the uh, charging system was wonky on it, so I don't know if it was a bad rectifier, that old selenium crap, so uh, I plan on putting a new solid state regulator rectifier in that one and uh, probably do the electronic uh, ignition conversion to get it off of points. I don't know. I might leave it original. We'll see. Classic. What is it? Classic motor? Classic. I don't think of it. Classic something uh, here in Houston. They've got a bunch of retrofit parts for the classic Hondas. Solid state ignitions and all kinds of uh, retrofit and upgrade parts. Common motor, that's it, common motor. Common-motor.com, I believe. That's the other thing I wanted to do to the little uh, CB125 is do the 12-volt uh, conversion on it because that's the, I think that it's not the last year. 82 is when they switched those over to a 12-volt system. But that's the older one that has a six volt system and you know crappy headlights and weak charging system and all that. So I'll do the 12 volt conversion on that, which is generally pretty easy from what I've read. You just have to get the uh, stator from a CB350, 360 and repin the plug on it. 
and that's it. Put a different regulator rectifier in it and you're done. And the whole bike is converted over to 12 volts at that point. Of course, you know, you change your bulbs out, but that's it. I really want to keep that CB125 original as much as possible. That's why I was trying to keep all OEM parts. Uh, I don't really want to mix with non-Honda parts, you know, clone parts, stuff like that. Not really for any particular reason, like resale or collectability or whatever, just for authenticity. Uh, if I can't find original parts, then, you know, I might substitute a few things, but I don't want to do a cafe conversion on it. I'd much rather keep it, you know, with the high swept curve bars and everything just like it was originally. I think it's really cool that way. There have been too many CB125 cafe projects and brat bike projects out there that, I don't know, they just don't look good to me. They're losing the, the history and the heritage there, I think. The other thing I was missing on the CB125 was the left side cover. Uh, the original side cover had a hole punched in it. I could get reproduction ones out of Thailand, but they're be getting, you know, becoming very hard to find, uh, and I'd be getting something that's not original. I think they're reproductions. They're not old stock. Uh, so, don't know. The weather's pretty nice this morning. It's humid, but mid-80s, I can deal with that. Not bad at all. Ah, still thinking about Gus and the boys out there riding around for the holiday. That's awesome. And Gus just put new uh, Olin's rear shocks on his. He put the video out yesterday. Good on you, Gus. I've been thinking about biting that hook, uh, but I'll do both at the same time. I'll do front and rear, so I need to reach out to uh, Olin's again and ask them if they've got uh, time to uh, do a, a front fork retrofit or rebuild on this thing. So what I would probably do is pull the forks and drain them and send them up there uh, to Olin's and see if they can put their cartridges in there, Nicks or whatever they're called, I forget the, the model, but uh, they've got the independent function, you know, big piston stuff. And I had discussed moving a while back, uh, that's still kind of on the table. My wife and I uh, have been discussing, or she actually floated the idea She's been floating it for the last few years, but it's getting more prevalent in conversation uh, of moving to Brazil. We could move down there. Uh, we've got family and property down there, so I don't know. I don't know if I could make that radical change. We're kind of waiting for my middle daughter to get out of high school. Once she's out of school, then my youngest is young enough that you know she can adjust and adapt to being wherever. Uh, I'm not particularly happy with the politics going on down there right now and you know the economy has been crap for quite a while and the politics are just making it worse so I don't know it may be in a couple more years we'll see if uh, if the political and persecution landscape changes uh, <laughs> I won't go into the politics here but uh, I don't know it could be an interesting change of life I enjoy the the old world lifestyle, you know, the southern countries, uh, Latin American uh, lifestyle. It's a lot more relaxed. Uh, even European lifestyle, for that matter, is a lot more relaxed, more life focused than the American culture. So, definitely would be nice to uh, have a different life paradigm, you know. Here we live to work. You gotta work all the time. You can't stop working. If you stop working, you're homeless. You better start picking out those uh, refrigerator boxes to live under a bridge because you're you're not gonna be uh, in the mainstream very long. You're gonna be uh, at the poverty level quicker than you can 
say, oh shit, what happened to my money? So, in uh, Brazilian life, Latin culture, uh, down there, everything is a lot slower pace. Uh, annoyingly so for me, because I've grown up in this environment and lived here where, you know, we want to get shit done, we want to work and uh, thrive and excel, uh, but at the same time that thriving and excel and always just going for more and more and more kind of leads to the rampant consumerism and everything that we uh, live here as a daily life. We're forced into it here, you know, it's not really a choice, you have to do it. Uh, this is a consumer-based economy here. So downshifting and getting into the slower lifestyle is hard for me. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm always busy. That's how my brain works. I can't, you know, do nothing. I can't sit around and not work for weeks at a time or months at a time. Yeah, I feel lazy when I do that. And uh, I'm an ADHD poster child, so uh, <laughs> sitting still for that length of time, just, I either go to sleep or it drives me nuts. Uh, but uh, once I adjust to that and, you know, maybe hybridize the lifestyle where it's more relaxed and I'm only working to live uh, and having fun and actually enjoying life instead of waiting until I'm, you know, mid-60s to re retire, quote-unquote retire. Uh, I don't know. I might like it. It's an option. We're considering it. I'll catch you in a bit. All right. Welcome back to my Friday afternoon. Knocking off early today. Try to get ahead of the uh, holiday traffic before rush hour hits uh, and before the heat of the day really kicks in. Uh, it's about, I don't know, 12.30 or 1 right now. I can't remember what time it is. A little afternoon. Uh, and I'm headed out on the little navvy. Look who gets to get out of the jail cell for a while. I need to uh, finish my rewiring on this thing, but uh, I had the plastics all apart and off of it, and I decided, oh, well, maybe I just need to take it out for a little exercise. So I'll do the uh, wiring stuff at home. Uh, yep, ready to go. Aired up the tires, and off I go. So maybe this weekend I'll have time to dig into this, finish the wiring on it, the AC to DC conversion, uh, and put the other LED lights in here that I have. They're in the top box behind me. You can hear them rattling around. <laughs> and uh, I've got my sliders that I could install in the, uh, in the variator as well. I just haven't uh, dug those out. I'm sure they're in my project box somewhere. Uh, did you lose the pedal, dude? So the battery's totally dead on this thing after sitting so long. I need to uh, stop and put fuel in it because the fuel is pretty much gone. If it stalls, i got to get off and kickstart it. Uh, I have a spare lithium battery in the back, uh, in the top box. One of my, uh, oh, what are they? The Western Power Sports uh, lithium iron phosphate. Good batteries. I've had very good luck with them. 1,538 miles on the clicker on this thing. I haven't put many miles on it in the last year. So I need to stop and get fuel first because I don't trust that gauge with the battery being low and I've already run this thing out uh, <laughs> a couple times on my uh, return commutes home. Uh, it's only about 15 miles of uh, range once it hits that red mark. Flip over to reserve, that's it. And it's uh, right at about 16 or 17 miles home, so I've, uh, I've had to push the last mile or two more than once. Well, lines for fuel today, alrighty. Maybe I'll go to another station. Man, yep, going somewhere else. I oh, don't know. They're done. Nope, they're just getting started. Okay, on to the next. Man, highway's the parking lot. I will say the Navi's running surprisingly smooth, though, uh, for having such old fuel in it and sitting for so long. The carburetor didn't get gummed up or anything because I turned the fuel off and ran the carb dry before I parked it. Uh, and then, I don't know, a couple months ago I pulled it out and I ran it and did the same thing again. Uh, but it it hasn't been started in probably three months. 
doing okay running smooth not hiccuping not uh, stalling out but it's warm enough out here I would expect that all right well as expected the camera got too hot and shut off but uh, I'm back kind of almost in my neighborhood stopped here to Chevron to uh, fill this thing up because I am sniffing fumes I'm gonna find out how low it is when I <laughs> fill it it's pretty low it's down at the bottom of the red so I think it would have coughed out before I got home man they're expensive here at this station regular it is they're 50 cents higher here the station used to be uh, competitive on pricing but not anymore or they just jacked up their prices today for uh, the holiday weekend that's probably what happened I'll roll by uh, Walmart over there in my neighborhood on the way home and see what the the price is. There she goes, just up to the top of the bar. Yep, right there at the top of the bar. So let's see. 0.174. Huh? <laughs> that ain't right. I'll top it up overflowing, but I put in well better than a gallon unless and now I guess maybe that's possible uh, 283 whatever two more pennies went out um, it's possible that the low battery is causing the uh, fuel gauge to be below where it should so maybe I had more in there than I thought but it was buried at the bottom of the red so I wasn't gonna take a chance on that well, I've pushed this thing once or twice or thrice and that's quite enough There we go. Okay. Go home and eat. I'm hungry. I didn't have breakfast this morning. Let's see if the uh, battery got charged up at all. Nope. Dead as a doornail. Oh, kickstand's down. Wait, let's see what to get. No. Yeah, click, click. That's it. <laughs> this battery's toast. It's been sitting discharged too long. But at least it's got a kickstart, right? All right. Off we go. I've got a tail tidy back there in the uh, top box that Kimmy Moto sent me months ago. Uh, it was, I want to say it was right before Christmas last year, or it might have been January of this year. And uh, that was right before my car accident in February and then the scooter accident in March. And my, my whole year just got screwed up for doing projects and I forgot all about it. I feel bad. They sent me the tail tidy for the Navi to do a quick review on, and uh, also, uh, what was it? Um, some waterproof panniers, uh, soft bags for adventure motorcycles, and some gloves, uh, some uh, winter uh, riding gloves. So those three things, I, I still owe them a review on those. I feel bad. I need to reach out to them and say thanks. I didn't mean to ghost you. I didn't sell the parts, they're just sitting waiting. <laughs> so maybe this weekend I'll put that tail tidy on here. And I see that the fuel gauge is full again now, so I don't know. I don't know, man. It's weird. Low battery is making the gauge uh, go down faster? I don't get it. But if I only put in, like, what, not even 0.2 of a gallon, then you know, that means it had a lot more in here. It's strange. One thing I wish the Navi had is a front disc brake. These drum brakes are so weak on this thing. It wouldn't have cost them much extra to put that on there. Uh, they have it in all the other markets. I mean, even India, where this one came from, the, uh, what is it, the Activa scooter. Uh, I think it's got a front disc. This one was final assembly done in Mexico. Pardon me while I try to get an eyelash out of my eye here. Yikes. Um, final assembly was done in Mexico and these are sold down there they have been for several years and they uh, they have uh, what is it the little uh, zoomer X down there uh, 110 and it's a really cool little scooter really cool uh, it's got front disc I think there would be oh, excuse me there wouldn't be any way to retrofit this you'd have to put different forks on it and everything in order to get a disc up front 
It might be possible to replace the triple tree on it, put a, a Grom tree on it. It's a pretty tall neck though. You have to take some measurements. And these aren't real forks. Anybody that uh, has uh, not looked at the parts diagram on these or disassembled them, uh, they're just springs with a rubber bumper down at the bottom. They're not traditional uh, hydraulic telescopic forks. I guess there's something to be said for the simplicity though. Yeah, there's no fork well to worry about, fork seals. I don't even think they've got fork seals. If they do, there's just maybe some grease or something in there, but from what I can figure out looking at the uh, service manual and the exploded parts diagrams, there's no oil, no nothing. It's just springs with uh, like guide bushings uh, between the fork lower and the stanchion, and uh, it's just springs with a rubber crush bumper down at the bottom. That's it. I know what I'll do this weekend. I'll drag the C3 out of the garage. That's what I'll do. I'll do a scooter face-off. Maybe I can wrangle my son into uh, running around parallel with me for a little bit and we'll try uh, uh, doing a top speed run side by side and fuel economy runs. I mean the, the C3 is definitely going to whoop this one's butt as far as fuel economy goes. It's fuel injected and much much more efficient. Uh, but yeah it'd be kind of interesting. Acceleration and top speed runs and all that. We used to be pretty much the same height and weight, but he's uh, a lot beefier than I am now. He's probably 20, 25 pounds heavier than I am. All right, so let's see what the fuel price differences are. Yeah, what did I say? Over 50 cents difference. Look at this. 313 for base unleaded, 338 for plus, 363 for premium. Uh, Plus was like four, four oh nine something back there. I can't remember what it was. It was over four bucks. So we're looking at almost seventy cents difference. It's crazy, crazy. That's another gas station I will never stop at again. That's weird because they used to be pretty competitive. I remember rolling by there a few mornings on my way out uh, and seeing their their prices, and they were lower than uh, this Walmart right here. I was like, wow. It's pretty good. <laughs> and now they've swung to 70 cents higher per gallon. Come on. All right. Well, home again, home again. And uh, I'm going to pull this thing up into the driveway. I've got a little bit of chores and honeydews that I have to take care of today. Left the driveway empty for that task. I need to get uh, my pressure washer out and do my rugs. So we got two or three uh, rugs that need cleaned up, so I will uh, catch you all later, maybe this weekend, we'll see.